I know how to bring him back. I talked him into how I bring him back. Hello and welcome to the Cancelled Movie Report, the documentary podcast series where we talk about all the best movies that Hollywood never made. My name is Camber and I'm your host, but I'm not alone. I'm never alone because with me, as always, he's an actor, he's a comedian, he's an all-around bloody good guy, Mr. Eden Porter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Eden, okay, let's talk about this week. I want to reveal something to you. Before this show even began, I put up a small little poll and I had a couple of script pages on it. And I said, which of these movies do you want to hear most about? And overwhelmingly, this week's movie was by far what people wanted to hear about. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, what are, we, right. what are we looking at? What are we looking at? Okay, so this week we are talking about Gladiator 2. So let's get into <laughs> it. Gladiator came out in the year 2000 and it is the perfect movie that doesn't need a sequel. So much to our surprise, in 2001... People were already developing a sequel to Gladiator. And it is not hyperbole to say that Gladiator had a huge impact on the cinema landscape as it was. Ridley Scott even got stuck in sword and sandals movies for about 10 years after he made this. And there was a million knockoffs to be released. But, Eden, I think before we talk about Gladiator 2, we need to recap Gladiator. Love it. So, there, I am aware that Gladiator is now, you know, 20 odd years old. And there are people that haven't seen it. Uh, it you know, it won a, a massive amount of Academy Awards, and it's regarded as a, you know, a, a classic, a modern classic now. But I think it's worth just broad strokes talking about what Gladiator was about for the couple of people that haven't seen it. Okay, so <laughs> and if, are listening to yeah, a podcast yes, about, about Gladiator, about its supposed <laughs> sequel, mm, piques my interest. I may uh, go back. First to one didn't interest me. Second one. What's that about? <laughs> Keep talking. Um, so basically, we've got Russell, good old Russell Crowe, yes. as, as Maximus. Yes. And um, so he's he goes from being the general of their armies mm-hmm. um, that he then gets betrayed. Yes. Yes, by uh, young uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Yes. Um, which is uh, an amazing bad guy turn, which he gets stuck in for a while. Um, but then he goes from the general, gets betrayed. He becomes a slave, the slave that becomes a gladiator. And the gladiator that defies an emperor. Yes, yes there and, you go. And so, and, and it, it does. And you know, full spoilers for this movie almost two oh, decades yeah, spo- ago. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, but famously, I would say it ends with a battle between Joaquin Phoenix and uh, Russell Crowe's Maximus, in which Maximus dies. Correct. That uh, is the end. That is the ultimate ending. <laughs> yes. That he. He dies. He, he sees his family again <laughs> yes. in in the afterlife, yes, and so, he's with them again. Yes, and th- that is in fact uh, an ongoing trope throughout the movie: is that he wants to meet his family again in Elysium in the afterlife. I think it's Maria and Marius, so he's uh, his wife and his kids. Um, you know, he makes some buddies when he's gladiating. Yes, um, when he's gladiating. <laughs> Just go go down the shops and do some gladiating. Um, yeah, no, he makes it. So who are his, who are his mates? Dijmi Hunson, yes, uh, plays Juba. He's like he probably his his best gladiator his best mate. Gladiator mate. <laughs> who says, uh, I, "I will see you again, but not yet." Yeah, yes. not yet. As he as he buries the little things in the sand. Yes, oh, exactly. Um, and it's also worth mentioning. And we talked about it a little bit at the top, but this movie also like reinvigorated the sword and sandals epics in Hollywood for, for quite a while. Well, it made them viable again yeah. uh, on a big budget scale. But the, before that, there were sort of little things thrown around and stuff like this, but this really brought it back into the, the forefront of people's um, thinking. Yeah, and the, the last one, I think, you know, th- there was the, the golden age of Hollywood with the huge budgets and whatnot, and then there was Cleopatra came out. Yes. And it was such a huge financial flop because it's so expensive to recreate that that people thought for a long time it's like it's not worth spending the money to do it because people aren't interested anymore. Because they did, they built all those huge sets and they, yeah. had, they had painted sets or behind sets yeah. in like with thousands and thousands of extras. It was insane. But once Gladiator comes out, you're getting that King Arthur reboot with Clive Owen. You're even even the stuff Ridley Scott's been had been making. Uh, Robin Hood oh, yeah. uh, was essentially almost Gladiator yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're getting uh, Gods of Egypt. So he kind of got stuck in this. He what? loved it so much. Well, then they even <laughs> they remade Ben Hood. For yes. no reason <laughs> yeah. at all. <laughs> so it's not crazy to to see why they wanted to make this sequel. Here's what you need to know about Gladiator 2. There was actually a few different versions of it, and the version that that we are going to be talking about was written by Nick Cave. Of oh, the musician. The musician, Nick Cave, of Nick Cave and the, the Bad, bad Seeds. <laughs> 
Does he? Is he a writer? He he actually is. Did so he do the proposition? He yes. Yeah, he did. He's, it's not unprecedented. It's just odd. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yes. Like we talked about, uh, you know, Justice League a few weeks back, and that was, you know, they're like Hollywood writer types that wrote that. Like they they yeah. write, you know, Geostorm and whatnot. But Nick Cave <laughs> had only written the proposition, and he had since has since now written the movie Lawless. and So he's, he's got a few credits, yeah, but okay. he is not your go-to sequel franchise no, writer. No, not for a not for a multi-million dollar Hollywood blockbuster, you wouldn't think. And, you know, I think naturally people were asking why this happened. And I've pulled a clip from what's kind of a, a, kind of a hostile uh, interview uh, that Ridley Scott was given while he's promoting one of the Alien movies, and they asked him about... About Nick Cave writing Gladiator 2. Uh, Russell, me, Nick Cave, and it was about bringing him back. It's a good idea. Where is it? It's on the shelf somewhere at DreamWorks. Why it, does Nick Cave write Gladiator 2? Uh, because uh, Russell knew him. Russell's a buddy of mine. And he said, listen, we've got some thoughts about what can we do with Gladiator? I said, well, I think we can bring you back. That's how it began. He'd been working with Nick Cave. So then Nick Cave, we talked, the three of us, and out of it evolved a screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Hostile does come to it. <laughs> Why isn't he here? Yeah. Where is it? <laughs> come on. Whatever. And it just, it, it, Russell Crowe was just like, oh, I got a friend of mine. I think he does scripts. Well, is, that, is that some connection from 40-odd um, foot of grunt? <laughs> <laughs> Russell Crowe's old band maybe, that he had? Maybe they, maybe. Were, maybe they were gigging together. <laughs> Yeah, he was opening for the bad seats. <laughs> um, but so the, the one we're talking about today is the Nick Cave movie. It is worth mentioning before we get into it, there was a second sequel being developed uh, by screenwriter John Logan uh, that wasn't going to feature Maximus or Gladiators. <laughs> Okay, and how, and how is that a sequel? Uh, and apparently Russell Crowe not happy with the idea that he wouldn't be back. But that brings us to the, the biggest point is that they're going to have to bring Maximus back somehow. And that's what we're going to get into. Now, let's talk cast. The only one confirmed to be returning really was Russell Crowe. Yep. And it becomes evident throughout the story why he's the only one returning from the original cast, really. But it it didn't have, like, a huge cast list attached to it already. It was mainly Russell Crowe. But in in, in, in terms of, you know, tones and elements, so obviously the biggest element is they had to bring him back. Russell. Uh, Russell Crowe from The Dead because Maximus died. Uh, And there's there's a clip from, uh, there's an interview from Nick Cave, which you'll hear at several points throughout this podcast to explain what's going on. Uh, But this is the first one when someone said, hey, wasn't Maximus dead? <laughs> it, you know, very briefly, it yeah. was Russell Crowe, wait, because he... Uh, I'm like, hey, Russell, didn't you die in Gladiator sure. 1? He's going, yeah, you sort that out. So, <laughs> so the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you saw that. You're the, you're the writer. That was that was the brief that he, he was given. Yeah, you, you sort, sort that, that out. out. <laughs> and then he throws a phone at you. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, the, the plot outline, I actually found a, a pretty great plot outline, better than the one I was writing from the Gone Elsewhere blog. So full credit to the Gone Elsewhere blog. I'm using their uh, recap with some recreations that we've done ourselves. Okay, so without any more preamble, let's get into Gladiator 2. The movie begins, Eden, in a storm. It's a dark and stormy wilderness. Everything's raging. And we follow two thieves as they stumble across a body of a gladiator lying in the mud. They strip the gladiator of his armor and his weaponry when one of the men suddenly goes silent. And a large spear has been embedded in his spine. As the other man flees, we see the gladiator turns and he is alive and it is... Maximus. Oh, no way. Gasping for air and frantic. And then uh, out of the shadows comes a, a middle-aged man who introduces himself. Another poor wretch dispatched to oblivion. Take it slow, my friend. What place is this? That is a good question. <laughs> Asked you what place is this. At first you'll be disoriented and confused. And indeed a little vexed, it is to be expected. But direct your anger elsewhere. I am a friend. Let me help you stand. Who are you? Me? My name 
is Mordecai. I keep the peace. Well, come on, follow me. Eat, you'll be hungry. Rough as a dog's guts, it's the best you'll find around here. I have been waiting for you. For me? I do not know you. But I know you, Maximus. I saw you fight just yesterday in the Colosseum. The Colosseum? I saw you slay the Emperor. I was there, but I was not there. I cheered, but no one heard me. Speak plainly. I saw you fall. I saw you die. No time for riddles. Oh, you have time, my friend. Ugh. You have an eternity. So just in case oh. that is a little unclear, right off the bat, this is taking place in the underworld. It- Called it. Yeah. <laughs> Called it. We've and it's, got an it's, underworld story it's here. It's important to note that uh, this isn't the Elysium that Russell Crowe had been picturing in the first movie, uh, which is kind of no, the, the it's wheat golden fields. fields. Yes. Uh, this is a dark, stormy forest underworld. This is and, um, scary. Yeah, it's a bit spooky. It's a bit supernatural. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, he's, he's been introduced to Mordecai, who is his guide of the underworld. So the story continues... Uh, Maximus there at the end, he's he's collapsed again. He's fallen asleep again. He's a bit dreary. He's just died. Yeah, give, him, give, him give him a break. break. Give him a moment. <laughs> uh, we cut to Maximus uh, making his way through the golden wheat fields. And his wife and son, Maria and Marius, stand beneath a giant poplar in the distance. Now, a poplar is a tree. That's a tree. I, That's yeah, a tree. I, I could have told you that. I could have told you that. Um, Big so poplar fan over here. This, <laughs> this, this beautiful uh, vista of families under poplars and golden wheats is suddenly hit by a storm again and heavy rain obscures his vision. And it is it's described as a fantastic bolt of lightning strikes the poplar and he violently awakes again. And he's back in this uh, muggy underworld. Uh, Mordecai approaches and explains that he has something that he needs to show him. So they walk along and Maximus stresses that he must locate his family in Afterlife. That's what he'd been working for That's, essentially yeah, the goal. whole yeah. movie yeah. Uh, in, in the first Gladiator. Mordecai tells him that there are people who search for the ones that they love and people who have given up the search. And over eternity, the former eventually becomes the latter. So he's pretty much telling him that, look, there's no hope you're ever going to find your family down here, man. Okay. Uh, and they, they approach the edge of a cliff. So beneath this cliff is a valley with an encampment, which is bordering a pitch black sea. Uh, and it's filled with an infinite number of the damned. And it's, this stretches on endlessly <laughs> to eternity as they climb it's down the It's very poetic. It very, really is. It's very the bad seeds. It, it, you, you can, like, throughout the how this script is written, You You can can see Nick Cave has a real way with words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Everything he describes is described quite beautifully. You know, even just, you know, the former eventually become the latter. It's it's quite quite poetically written. However, this imagery of dark encampments near Black Sea stretching on for eternity... Not really in the iconography of Gladiator. No, it fe- no, it's, no yeah, that's true, which is very much, yeah, the Colosseums yes. and deserts and yes. things like that. Yeah, so very, oh, man. So they make their very- way down into the camp. And uh, as they're walking through, Mordecai actually breaks up a fight between two women, and he explains that he's a bit of a peacekeeper in the afterward. That's kind of his job. Uh, and in the midst of their conversation, the crowd explodes with excitement. And in the distance, a lone man glides along the dark sea on a small boat. And thousands pour into the water shouting, Elysium! As the boat disappears into the fog. Mordecai pronounces them fools for believing there's any escape into Elysium. So, very dark. Hang on, if there there was a man on a boat... He's sailing off into the Black Sea. Okay. Thinking he's going to Elysium. Oh, okay. And Mordecai essentially he's says like, to him, you're he's an idiot. idiot. He's, he's, he goes on for eternity. Yeah, the exactly. damned is there. Like, you're not going anywhere, mate. Exactly. Okay. So they eventually come to a massive ruined temple. And Mordecai essentially says, look, this is where I leave you for now. There's, there's people inside this temple that must talk to you. And when Maximus enters this huge ruined temple, he's greeted by... The Roman gods themselves. Yes. Yes. I'm talking Jupiter, Apollo, 
Pluto, Neptune, Mars, Mercury, and Bacchus. They are all sitting around a big table. All the planets. They're all sitting around a big table muttering when Maximus enters the scene. Give me room. Behold the mighty gladiator in all his thundering. <laughs> Speak, gladiator. State your purpose. What brings you here? I seek my wife and my son. Were they good people, gladiator? Were they kind? They were. Were they honest and compassionate? Yes. Were they virtuous, gladiator? Did the little birds twitter as they passed by? Yes. Well, you won't find them around here. (laughs) (laughs) Can you help me, old man? Or not? Ye gods, this man means business. Old? It is true. But a mere man? I think not. I could assign you to oblivion in a mere breath. I've come to you in good faith. Can you help me? Hush. Listen. What is that I hear? The winch of fortune turning in your favor. How so? Listen to me, Maximus. There is this man. His name is Hephaestus. He is, well, one of our own. He has disappeared, turned his back on us, lit out into the wilderness, the great desert, his head full of devils and bad ideas. A man, man. A dissident. His brains swarm with all manner of damnable and most dangerous notions. And he has converts, Maximus. Converts. Apostles. Fanatics. He is an agitator. He squeezes the bellows of dissent. A little wind, a mere puff. But within the presage of pandemonium, am I making myself clear? No. Hephaestus has certain ideas about omnipotence. He believes there is a being greater than us. Can you imagine it? This evil little idea is growing, collecting weight. Some of the rabble are actually listening to him. This little idea is hurting us. Look about you. We are not always this way. We are sick unto death. Languishing. What has this to do with my wife and child? We are suffering, Maximus. But we are not without our powers. We can bring you and your family together. Indeed, I can do it in a breath. If you have such great powers, why not deal with this problem yourselves? It is not so simple. Hephaestus, he is one of us. In any case, your reputation precedes you, Gladiator. What do you want me to do? Find him. Find him. And kill him. So a pretty intense oh, scene there. Mate. And very atmospheric. The gods. The have gods spoken. Themselves. So I think it has now become clear that this movie is a lot denser than yeah. the original yes. Gladiator. And in fact, I want you to tell me, Eden, do you know what was happening in that scene completely? No. <laughs> I heard the word bellows yes. and, and the winch of fate, so there's yes. obviously a lot of machinery around. Uh, so, <laughs> look, it, it, is, it is quite a poetic scene. It, yeah, definitely. very much so. Um, uh, there's some, you know, lit out into the wilderness, and there's some great lines of dialogue oh, in there. It sounds great. But essentially, broad strokes, they're saying, hey, Hephaestus has abandoned us. Yeah. He's one so of our he's, own. he's one of the gods. Yeah. He's he's turned his back on the gods. He thinks there's a greater god above yeah. the gods, yeah. and he's starting to get people on board yeah. thinking this. And as a result, the 
the We're regular dying. regular Joe God, yeah, <laughs> is, uh, losing those that that concept of people worshiping them, and yes. they're, they're getting weaker. And in fact, just to double down on this as a theme, uh, we've got another clip of Nick Cave from the same interview. Yeah. However, so they're talking about you know you got to find Hephaestus and kill him because yeah. he's hurting us. Nick Cave seems to be remembering maybe a different draft or a different movie because who he's hunting changes a bit. <laughs> When you did something like that, what did you bring to that? I mean, how did you? What was the story for the for the second Gladiator? Well, that's where it all went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, all right, so he goes to purgatory. Yeah, um, and is sent down by the gods who are dying in heaven because there's this one god. There's this there's this Christ character down yeah. on 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 Earth. Who is gaining popularity and be, and so the the, the 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 many gods are dying and so they send Gladiator back to kill Christ right. and <laughs> and all his followers. <laughs> so, um, and so this was always get, already getting it. I wanted to call it Christ Killer. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now that. Is a film. Yes, and I'm not even going to, to tease anything with false uh, promises. Christ does not appear oh, in this film. Man. <laughs> uh, but the idea of Christ is very heavy in this film. Okay. The idea of changing of religions plays a big part in this film. And again, these are themes nowhere near Gladiator. No, not at all. And the fact that he refers to the character as Gladiator. As a well. lot of people... Just refer to him as Gladiator yeah. to the point where I don't know if Nick Cave has seen Gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's like, what is it, Gladiator who died? Oh, fair, right, right, right. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> no problem. R- Russell, yeah, yeah, get him. <laughs> okay, let's continue with yeah. the story. So uh, Maximus exits the, uh, the the tomb and he's got his mission now. But Mordecai warns him that the gods are lying. He said that he cannot be reunited with his wife because she has sacrificed her place in Elysium to allow their son Marius to cheat death. Marius was resurrected and returned to Earth, specifically Rome, where he lives out his days. And as for Maria, she could be anywhere in the netherworld, never to be found. So now we're dangling this thread that maybe his son is out there somewhere. Alive and and well. And, and, you know, maybe by him killing Hephaestus, maybe there's a chance that he'll at least see his son. Maximus actually refuses to listen to uh, to Mordecai, kind of plays it no mind, and he heads off into the desert. Uh, uh, he's chasing a vision of his wife. He's seeing her in the distance in the everywhere. Desert. She's very much in his head. Uh, he chases her into the desert, and it leads him to a bloodied, dying stag that is entangled in brambles. He attempts to free it, but the animal's wounds are too severe, and his wife's voice the whole time is booming around him, help us, help us, as the stag takes its last breaths. So it's it's very cerebral what's this happening to him. Now, this is a Hollywood blockbuster film. Yes. With well, a dying stag. No. This is an art house film. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm starting to see that. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so Was it the dying stag that gave that away? The, the-, the ghost of a wife yeah, yeah. passed on. Who knows? In the, that dying stag scene goes for 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, look, here's a bit of tease coming on. More dying stags coming up. Okay. Uh, so Maximus actually locates Hephaestus' camp and he finds it completely abandoned uh, except for Hephaestus himself who's lying down dying at this point. And Maximus approaches Hephaestus to you know, finish the deal. I have been waiting for you. I feared you would not come. I have been sent to kill you. We are dying, we gods, fading from the grand scheme. It is for the better. They have deserted me, my followers, left me here to die. Do you see them? They lost faith. They fear death. Oblivion, I tried to tell them, hold true, and the rewards will be beyond measure. Oh, my children, I have seen the way things shall be. There is but one God. May he forgive all that we have done. Oh, the rivers of blood. 
The torrent of tears. I must find my wife. And my son. Yes, your son is in grave danger. He stands before the great storm. In his hand, the nub of truth. My son, what, what are you talking about? We are all in such terrible and grave danger. Where is he? What do you mean? Come, I will show you. <gasps> and as he grabs Maximus, they're transported. Before we talk about where they're transported to... How are you feeling so far? Okay, I've got, I've got, I've got chills. You've got chills. Chills. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. What? Oh, man, are you kidding me? No. This is this film is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so not only so they come to the camp, everyone's dead. You don't know. Uh, well, no, they've no, just, not dead. They've, just they've abandoned. abandoned him. Yes. But then, and then he's dying yeah. himself. He doesn't sound like a bad guy. He, he, he doesn't. He sounds like he is kind of on the right path. So and where is this going then? Well, we're, we're like, like it well, seems... Get ready, Eden, for a pivot. And what? And what? how far into the film are we at this point? We're, you we're 20 pages. Tw- okay, 20 pages. Yeah, so this is, yeah, that's me uh, estimating. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's a fair... We spent a fair bit of time, time in the underworld in so this, this movie. Okay, so this is still set up really for the main focus of the film? Yes, really? uh, this film... We're about to discover just changes track uh, and almost becomes another film again. Uh, this it is, is, <laughs> this is. This is. And this is Russell Crowe, Gladiator 2. Yes. Man, I wonder who they would have. You know what would be great? Like casting all these sort of. Who'd you get in for the gods and yep. everything like that? I just Did they did, did it get to that point? No, no. And we'll explain why okay. it didn't get to that okay. point at the end. Was it the it, Jesus it, killing? Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how it sounded like he was pitching it. Well. When Hephaestus grabs Maximus, Maximus is transported back to the world of the living. No. Maximus rises out of the body of a dying Christian in the midst of a massacre in lions. What? Yeah, you heard. He, uh, in fact, I have an explanation for what you've just heard in just a second. Okay, please. he, He rises out of the body of a dying Christian in the midst of a massacre in lions. It's a mob scene, dozens of Christians being beaten and hacked to death by the Emperor's forces. Uh, now, so, what, what do I mean he rises out of the yeah, body of a dying what, that's Christian? that's what I'm thinking. Well, I won't explain it. I'll let Ridley Scott explain oh, thank it. thank God. But, you know, I can bring him back. I know how to bring him back. I talked him into how I bring him back. Oh. He is the portal of a dying warrior as a portal that could bring somebody back. I still don't get it. <laughs> no. And that is the only explanation they ever give. Now, I believe that there is something in Roman mythology about uh, warriors dying it is a great uh, like portal to the afterlife. Yeah. And maybe this is about hacking that. Okay. But okay. it but is can we never go, so expressly we- explained why Maximus wakes up through the body of a dying Christian being But is he, is he now flesh and blood... Christian man. Here's the thing. He looks like Russell Crowe. <laughs> okay, of course he does. Of he, course he does. He still looks like Russell Crowe. Did the Christian look like the Russell Crowe? Crow. Maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. So, okay, so I'm I'm, so, I'm I'm thinking that it's like he inhabits the body of this dying Christian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But this but <laughs> because it's Russell Crowe, you want Russell Crowe in the movie. Yeah. They're not going to get someone else to play the role. And also, uh, look, I slight spoilers for a scene until ahead of time. You would think, hey, maybe we just see Russell Crowe, but everyone else sees this Christian. Yes. But there are people that are like, hey, you look like... No, yeah, no, yeah. no. So no. it is Russell Crowe for all intents and purposes in this body. The body is Russell Crowe. But the scene okay. goes on. I, I, I must continue. Maximus sees an elderly bishop on the verge of being slaughtered. Maximus grabs a weapon and begins hacking away the attackers. He is overwhelmed by the crowd and restrained. Before a killing blow is delivered, an unseen voice orders to stand down. Down. A 25-year-old Lucius, who, fun fact, from the original Gladiator movie, is the nephew of Joaquin Phoenix, now 25 years old. Yes, and he goes... um, I will cheer for you, Spaniard. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That kid, that little, the that little kid, kid from Unbreakable. Yes. 
Oh, oh yes, yeah. very good. So a twenty-five-year-old Lucius, he could play that now. Actually, come to think of it. Well, he's just done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's yeah. just done glass. Twenty-five-year-old <laughs> uh, Lucius uh, approaches. Lucius asks the rebel his name. He thinks that he has seen him before. Maximus does not answer, but pleads for the bishop's life to be spared. Lucius responds by nonchalantly decapitating the old man. Oh, that's what he didn't want to happen. He orders the guards to kill Maximus, but Maximus manages to escape. Of course he does. So, Lucius is the villain of this movie. Oh, okay. He has become the Joaquin Joaquin Phoenix Phoenix version 2. Power mad, yep. um, you know, psychopathically violent. Is he ruler. like emperor? Is he the ruler, or is he just like a general? Or he something? is next in line to be to the be emperor okay, good. in this in this movie. But what a weird turn for that character, who is in in the original he, movie is the eyes of innocence through that story. Yeah, and so what is it, the idea that seeing his his favorite gladiator kill his what his, his uncle, uncle yeah. has somehow driven him to the point of sociopathic madness look with this being a nick cave story i i tend to think it's his his i like it's his dwellings on that we all become the person that we didn't want to become oh. and eventually you know oh so you live long enough to become the villain yeah it's saying? the dark knight rule yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay so maximus escapes uh this slaughter uh down the road he encounters two men peter and marcus who ask for his help he follows them to a sanctuary where their leader, Arrhenius, uh, gives Maximus uh, the brief history of their predicament. It turns out that Lucius and the Emperor seek to put down Christianity. Right? They want to wipe it away from the world totally. And the Christians, they need help alerting their leader in Rome, who was a school teacher named Cassian. And the Emperor is on the verge of finding Cassian, and Maximus must help alert Cassian to this. Right, so, so com- convoluted. Okay. So, right, so it, it, so Christianity is a thing. Yes. So it, it's it's so Jesus. So Jesus has happened. Jesus has happened. Okay, Jesus has happened. Christianity is a thing now. Okay, they've risen up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think I know where we so, are. Yeah. So Lucius and the Emperor want to stamp Christianity out completely, uh, and there there are a group of uh, Christians, but there is a leader in Rome called Cassian, Cassius. and Cassian. they're scared okay. that Cassian is about to be found out. So Maximus actually refuses to help. And he heads off alone. He heads off alone. Now, this isn't the first time in this story that Maximus had refused the the advice and help of of people. Yeah, exactly. This seems to be his MO. It it really is. So along the path to the city, he's heading to Rome because that's where he hears that his boy might be. Along the path to the city, uh, he actually finds a family of butchered Christians. And uh, he's trying to console the the sole survivor, a little girl, but she's not really paying any mind to him when suddenly a figure appears behind him. Save your strength, gladiator. I am already dead. Mordecai. The gods allow me to return from time to time. For services rendered, you see. But I suspect it is just to torment me. I wish I could feel that sun. You can see me. Others can't. What are you doing here? You, my friend, have angered the gods. They have deemed you never return. Return? To the other world. I've seen that world. For now, my place is here. Look at these people. They have spent their days preparing for this moment with just a whisper of hope in a better world. A world without end. They have laid their true prize of eternity to waste. Their brief... Beautiful lives. I've witnessed the way these people are. They lay themselves before the swords like beasts. I must go. Must find my boy. Your boy? He is no longer a boy. Many years have passed since you died. Your son will be a man. A man? How can that be? Time here rushes by, Maximus. In the other world... It crawls. How will I know it's him? You are his father. You will know him. Can you tell me where he is? He is in Rome. That is all I know. But I do know what he is. What is that? Look around you, Maximus. He's a Christian. 
Oh. oh. Couple of things there. Yep. Mordecai's back. <laughs> in Remember this guy? celestial form. Okay. So Only Maximus sort of can see, see Mordecai. Correct. And Mordecai does appear throughout the movie as Maximus's spiritual guide. Is it sort of just like there's a lot of just exposition? Just a lot of exposition. But just I will give it this. It is well written exposition. Yeah, that's true. The explanation time here, a uh, time beneath crawls up. Uh, so time beneath uh, grinds up here. It crawls. Yeah, they're quite good. Ex like poetic yeah. explanations yeah. for no, things. That's good. But uh, it is a lot of characters telling other characters kind of. Look, what's this, going this on? What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's happening. Can you? Uh, yeah, yeah. But it does it more gracefully than say Justice League that we talked about a few weeks ago. That's like, look, this is the bad guy. This is where I came yeah, from. This yeah, is, this is what he can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At least it's well written exposition. Well, this is, yeah, and that's all you can ask for, really. But the bombshell, his son Marius. Can I? Do you reckon? Is a Christian. Yeah. Do you reckon it's the? Well, you know. Well, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's your? I want to hear your I'm, prediction. I'm, th- I'm thinking it's what Cass- Cassius. Cass- oh, Cassian. Cass- so I oh, okay. think that that's his son. He's changed his name because mm-hmm. he doesn't want to be known as mm. the, the Gladiator's kid. That I I, 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 will, I will not give you a hint whether you're right or wrong. Okay. But it's a very interesting theory. Shall we continue? Please. After arriving in Rome, Maximus checks into an inn where several people seem to recognise him. So, his, so this the, is an this ongoing is crazy, motif man. of people being like, you, you're familiar, yeah. can't pick it. Uh, at the palace, we now cut to the palace, uh, Emperor Decius scolds Lucius, our villain, for being too bloodthirsty. Lucius defends himself by explaining that in his mind, the empire is dying. Plague, famine, earthquakes, they're all the results of the gods being angry. And the Christians mock their divinity and they must be destroyed. Uh, their leader must be found. He, he very specifically is looking for Cassian. The emperor reveals that there is a census being taken. Anyone who is Christian will be arrested and they'll be provided with an opportunity to recant and if not, they'll be put to death in the Colosseum in a spectacular fashion. And he ends the scene by saying, the people will be entertained. <laughs> I gotta love a good callback. Yeah. <laughs> Are you not entertained? <laughs> um, interesting tactic for mm-hmm. gathering up Christians there. A census. Um, a census. Mm. Um, surely you would just not tick, yes, I'm a Christian, <laughs> on the box of religions. Lying wasn't invented. Oh, okay, okay. Well, well, that's all right then. It's a form. You've got to tell the truth. It's a census, guys. That, yeah, Take it it's seriously. It's a goddamn <laughs> census. You can't put Jedi... But th- that is their tactic at the moment, to stamp out Christianity. They've got a census going and they're going to find out who the Christians are and they can either give up Christianity or be put to death in the Colosseum. So as this is going on, we actually cut to the house of Cassian, the school teacher, and there is a group of rebellious Christians having a meeting about the census and what they're going to do. Who wrote us this letter? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. But the edict, Cassian. We will each be exposed. And what of our movement if we are hunted down? What of our church if we are all put to the sword? Lucius, this day, has arrived in Rome in search of us. We must make a stand. For his sake... We face death all day long. For his sake, we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Justin is right, Cassian. We must no longer fear the enemy of truth. We must challenge them and drive back the great serpent and champion of the Antichrist, Lucius. With what? Our bare hands. The same Christ who tells us to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us. You'll be hunted down and annihilated. Who are you? I'm a messenger. And? I was in Lyons. I saw a mob massacre men just like you and washed the streets in their blood. I watched Lucius behead a man called Palantheus. I saw slaughtered women and children. Palantheus? The Bishop of Lyons? The former Bishop of Lyons. We do not shudder at our own blood, streaming forth. That is not what I saw. I saw much shuddering and much streaming forth of blood. I met a man named Arrhenius. He asked me to alert you to the arrival of Lucius. 
You wanted me to tell you what I'd seen. Erroneous. Then you are Christian. I... I was a Roman soldier. Then you served the devil himself. Marius. You will die. And glory in it. Leave this place, idolater. We have no use for you. Maximus exits the house and walks down the street. Dear, oh dear. Mordecai. Clearly, Hephaestus had motives of his own for bringing you here. That's him up there, you know, in his more robust days. And there's mighty Jupiter, now fat and old and cancreous. My son does not know me. Of course not. Your son will have no recollection of you at all. Ah, but isn't he like his father? My son does not even know me! Wow. Finally, father and son are reunited, but not in the way you'd expect. No, not at all. He doesn't recognize him. So to put your theory to rest, it isn't Cassian. No, it's definitely not wrong. Though Marius is a follower of Cassian. And in fact, that relationship is explored a little further in the story. So we actually find now Lucius walking the halls of the palace. And as he passes a bust of a famous Roman general, he stops in disbelief. No. Who could the bust Who be? Who would it be? Who do we know? There's been a Roman was general. was a famous Roman yeah, general exactly. that Lucius might know. It's Maximus. <laughs> Mate, bloody well, Maximus, isn't it? <laughs> I, I would never and, reveal and what whether, a, whether it's Maximus or not. What a great bust he has. <laughs> Well, that, my friends, is the end of part one of the cancelled movie report for Gladiator 2. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we would love it if you could subscribe, be it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you like to listen. It really does help us get discovered in the charts. It would also be terrific if you could give us a five star rating or, you know what, most importantly of all, just tell a friend. We're completely independent here at Cancelled Movie Report, so your support really does mean the world to us. Hey, what do you think of the movie so far? And did we miss anything? We would love to hear from you. You can always get in touch with us via cancelledmovies at gmail.com or at cancelledmovies on all of the socials. Hey, maybe you have a cancelled movie project you've always wanted to hear about. Why not let us know? You can fill out a form in the episode description alerting us to a project and we may just give it the cancelled movie report treatment. I'm Michael Campbell. I hosted and edited this episode. Eden Porter was my co-host too. We both produced the show. And Sam DiLorenzo was the sound engineer. We would also like to thank our amazing voice cast, all of which are listed in the episode notes. Make sure you're listening next week for the conclusion of Gladiator 2. But if you can't wait, here is a sneak peek. That is next level epic. <laughs> I'm sorry. So they've, thought of, they've got, what did we have on the first one? We had the Tigers. Yes. Yeah, we had that the, was the big that thing. That was the big thing. <laughs> and it came out and attacked and they released a yeah. sequel. What beats Tigers? Naval battle with alligators. Correct. <laughs> but until next time, take care.